When, hello everyone. This is Dr. Kamani, licensed clinical psychologist. We are here for real talk about HR. We're gonna be talking about ways that you can leverage your power and knowledge about HR, legal, and mental health in the workplace. So today we have two very special guests. Um, so just tune in today, okay? So uh, I'm gonna have my special guests introduce themselves and we're gonna get right into the conversation. So again, this conversation is really for those of you who are still at a toxic job, right? So if you're still at a toxic job and or maybe you have left a toxic job and you're trying to figure out how do I get in a situation so that the same thing that happened to me in the other toxic job doesn't happen again, right? So we're here to share some resources with you. So thank you for tuning in. So I'll turn it over first to Dr. Claire. So if you can introduce yourself and then we'll go to your sister. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Kamani. Really pleasure to be here and really excited because I'm joining with one of my favorite people in the entire planet. So I am Dr. Claire. I am an unapologetic racial and social justice warrior working at the intersection of mental health, racial and social justice, health equity, and DEI. I have a consultancy, Dr. Claire Speaks, which focuses on that and also partner with my sister, Shar, on chapter two, which that means I'm passing it to you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. And good afternoon, good evening, good night, good morning, because I know that I have some friends who told me they were going to log in from Asia. So hello to everyone. So I am Charmaine, founder and CEO of Chapter 2 LLC, which is a business and talent optimization consultancy. And really what we're focusing on is helping businesses, leaders, everyone, change agents, really think about how do you actually increase your engagement, and how do you improve the results for business and the talent experience, leveraging cognitive, behavioral, and emotional intelligence and insights, because centering wellness is important to us. Absolutely. Centering wellness is everything. And, you know, over the past year, I've been talking about Black women at toxic jobs because we know that being in a toxic job can really profoundly impact us spiritually, physically, psychologically, right? <clears throat> So we're here to talk about ways to support Black women who may be in a toxic work environment or who are leaving and want to be informed about some things, right? So Shar, I'm going to start with you. So what are the things that you have observed or experienced as an HR leader, as a business leader in relation to toxic uh, work environments and the impact it's had on people, particularly Black women? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Look, I've been in HR for almost two decades now, and I can tell you that every organization is the same for me in many ways, right? We believe that we enter an organization and we're going to be protected and it's going to be safe. But the reality is, and the thing that I want people to really understand is that you're never going to be safe in an organization in the way that you may fully need to, because organizations are made up of people and people possess biases prejudices and all the other isms and, you know, views that don't really support that. Right. So yeah. really I've seen a lot. I've seen people be heard. I've seen people, you know, lose their sanity. Quite frankly, I've had employees die. I've had, you know, so a lot happens. Right. But yeah. the thing I would say most, and I, and this talk is so timely because I've had so many people message me lately about this is what, Black or other people of color may do to each other in these spaces that further add to that harm. And that's yes. something that I think we need to also talk a lot about too. Absolutely, Shara. And you know, I did two videos actually about Black women, Black people in the workplace, right? And how painful it is when the person who's contributing to toxicity is another Black person, particularly another Black woman. Ashley Claire, Dr. Claire was on one of those panels, right? I watched. So, <laughs> so I'm going to include that information in the description section for anyone who's watching this right now, because I've had a lot of, just like you, I've had a lot of Black women reach out to me and say, what about when the other person is another Black person or a Black woman? It is so painful. It takes the pain to another level. Now, Dr. Claire, what about for you? So given what you heard Shar talk about, what about from your perspective in terms of a, as a business leader and a mental health clinician? What has been your experience in terms of those with toxic work experiences and the impact it's had on them? 
Uh, absolutely. Even speaking for myself, uh, the physical harm, the psychological disease, you know, we often equate our work experiences with a some kind of lack that we have. And that's because often in those workspaces, we're told if you're not able to do this, it's a you problem. Never mm-hmm. considering the fact that it's a system problem. It's the yeah. culture of the organization. But mm-hmm. you know, for myself and other people I know, even in terms of treating people, because you and I are both clinicians, you know, mm-hmm. the 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 psychosomatic challenges that come up, right? With the the stomach aches, the the mm-hmm. headaches, the mm-hmm. nausea, the difficulty with sleeping, dis- difficulty yes. with concentration the mm-hmm. challenges in personal relationships because of agitation, mm-hmm. depression, anxiety, uh, physical uh, ailments that can exasperate to, to, to heart challenges and other, yeah. other issues. The, the activation of autoimmune disorders or the worsening of autoimmune disorders. And so when we, we think about the toxicity in our workplaces and why I'm so yeah. grateful that Shar's here, both as my, you know, guru of all things hr i know not all things hr but she's my twin sister i'm not i'm I, she, she's the best person she's the best hr person i know but but also from her lived experience and my lived experience and your lived experience of being a black person navigating yeah. those systems and so we see these psychological uh, physiological, emotional, spiritual, and relational damage. You know, while we use the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual here for for diagnosing mental illness and mm-hmm. mental health needs, you know, the international lens is the ICD-11, and the ICD-11 included burnout in their list of, of, of things to consider that can happen for people. So it's not a di- yeah. formal diagnosis, but we're yeah. recognizing it, right? And we're recognizing, yeah. I mean, we had the 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 White House a few months ago come out and the, our, our leadership, our health leadership come up and talk about the implications for workplace stress on mental health. And so yeah. here we're seeing this. And so when we think about why is it important to acknowledge the lens of HR? And I think mm-hmm. this is a unique conversation because Shar is an HR professional and Shar is a black woman. Yes. She, yes. Is, she has not escaped the harms of being a black woman in the workspace while also trying to navigate the toxicity of these environments and yes. work to pr- pr- advocate to protect the, the employees and balance yes. against the interests of the organization. And I think yes. that that's a really unique lens. And I often mm-hmm. think of what does that do, particularly around uh, the allostatic ad- load that we carry, which is the, the cumulative uh, measure of stress in our bodies and how that can com- come out, particularly because of mm-hmm. our experiences. So when we think about different intersectionalities and different identities, right, what it is to be Black, what it is to be woman, what it is to be an immigrant, all these different things and now navigating the workspace, we know that that level of toxicity is so damaging. And to your point, and to your point, because it was raised in, in when we did the talk uh, Mm -hmm. with you on the other thing about death, literally, right? And Shar mentioned employees dying, right? And so that's a real thing. And that's serious it is. And that's why, because for for all of the stats, when we think of health, Black people in particular Mm -hmm are by far doing the worst when it comes Absolutely. to health. Absolutely. We don't, we don't need a competition for mortality deaths with m- maternal mortality, for diabetes, for hypertension, for schizo. We don't, we don't need that. And yet yeah. we're, we're among the leading cause that and people of indigenous and native American backgrounds. And so it's really important that we're talking about this because Absolutely. it's really a matter of life and death. Absolutely. I was, I was, I'm co-sign with that. Absolutely. And and I think it's so important because when we think about work, many times think about work for survival. Many people don't conceptualize work can kill you, like your job can kill you. And so you have to really take that seriously and recognize what are the signs that you're being harmed, number one, and then what are you going to do about it? So this is the what are you going to do about it, right? So learning those tools, those resources about what to do about it. And, you know, in terms of what thinking about Black people, in terms of our mortality stats, the research is also showing that for Black women, we're now dying at earlier ages. We're getting cardiovascular disease at earlier ages, right? So we have to take this seriously, okay? So that's that's very, very important. So I'm so glad you said that. So for both of you, you know, we talked about, you know, we're all in, no matter what our fields are, right? We're all in fields to help people, right? Mental health, human resources. But the irony is that we're in these fields to help people, but we've also experienced harm. 
as we're trying to harm other people, right? So that's just a hard thing to kind of grapple with. So question, why do you think this is happening? Why do you think these toxic work environments are happening in general and particularly for Black women? Either one of you. What about you, Star? What's up with you, Star? Thank you. Who said this? This is a heavy question. Look, you know, it goes back to what I said. Mm -hmm. Organizations, every single company is made up of people and our yes. lived experiences and our intersectional identities and what we've been exposed to or not exposed to in life is going to shape the way we show up. It's going to shape mm -hmm. the way that we view others. It's going to shape the way we view ourselves. So yes. what I tell people and I really want people to understand is that if I am a member of any group mm -hmm. and I experience harm in the workplace, it doesn't mean that I cannot perpetuate harm for somebody else. Right? Mm, and that's point. important to recognize, right? Yes. You, yes. Two things can be true at the same time. Yes. The sun can be up and it can be re rain it. Yes. I, some I can tell you I have seen this happen a million times, right? It yes. Happens. So we really need to acknowledge the two things can happen. So when you say, yes. well, why is it happening? It's happening because people are in workplaces. Right. Mm -hmm. And we are programmed based on our experiences, our cultural lens or worldview, our geography and all the experiences that we've had to filter. Right. If yeah. you knew, both would know more about this than I do because you're experts in the brain. But, you know, we're wired for survival. Yes. You know what feels safe? What does it? Right. And that's mm -hmm. driven by familiar, similar to me, and unfamiliar, yes. not similar yes. to me. So mm -hmm. if we are biologically wired to put danger or unsafe against something that we do not know, how do we expect that I walk into an organization and a person of color or someone else with a, you know, uh, who was represented in another type of community or maybe several intersectional identities, if you think mm -hmm. about any other BIPOC, let's label, let's cross that with you know, LGBTQ plus community, let's cross that with, you know, national origin, let's cross that with disability status. How do we expect that someone else who has not experienced that is not going to other them or put them in a not safe category and therefore, whether consciously or subconsciously, now engage in things and behaviors that may be harmful? So yes. in short, because organizations are made up of people, you're going to have this. So I really, really, really want to impress, and I know I've said it a couple of times, no mm -hmm. organization is going to be safe for you. I don't care what statements they put out. I don't care what values they, they espouse to have. Mm -hmm. They can, that's, those are aspirational things. It's not really the reality. And Claire and I mm -hmm. wrote about this on our website, you know, chapter2.com, and I know you'll ping it out. We have an insights section that we call Gems and Gemisodes, where we're dropping knowledge, we're dropping gems, right? And we've written about this. There's one essay, and it's two parts, called Expecting the Ally That You Refuse to Be. And in that, we really go through what the impact is, not only in workplaces, but how BIPOC don't show up for each other, and how Ooh. internalized oppression is actually behind that, and a lot of people don't recognize that. Oh, that's deep. Okay. So I would definitely include that in the description section. What about for you, Dr. Claire, in terms of, um, you know, building a public shower just said? Yeah, I mean, why, ditto, why ditto everything she said to infinity yes. and beyond. You know, I, I yeah. think whenever even myself having these conversations or going through the harms I've experienced and listening to the harms other people have experienced, we tend to have this cognitive dissonance between the organization and mm -hmm. the humans in the organization, right? We put right. This, it's it's this sentient being, right? Like like we are humans. Yeah. A building is not an organization. An organization is made up of people. Yes. And sometimes yes. people suck. Let's just yeah. <laughs> like, True. And, True. and that that is the piece. Even when we see right now what's been happening in tech, like all these big layoffs, and they're like, this organization. No, there were people that made the decision to dehumanize, devalue, and not even acknowledge the contributions of individuals and don't even care enough to to let them know that they no yeah. longer had a job. We've seen the stories of people who were traveling for work and getting ready to do a presentation only to try to log in and could no longer log in. And that's how they found out while away on business for the company that the company let them go. But the company was the manager, the company was the CEO, the CFO, yes. the HR team. And I know sometimes HR, 
gets a lot of blame. And I know I'm biased because there's definitely been many times, and Shar's not the only HR professional in my life. She's just my favorite. But there's many times that I know people who are HR who the CEO didn't even tell about the layoffs. They, wow. they found out. They found out when everybody else found out, and then they have the responsibility to scramble to figure out how to fix it because of the legal yeah. issues. Or yeah. you know, the CEO decided to fire someone who was on maternity leave, and yeah. those types of things, right? And so. I, I think that because we keep seeing the organization and we, mm -hmm. we personalize it, it mm -hmm. allows us to be distant from it and not hold people accountable. These things continue because the lack of accountability in these systems, these things continue yeah. because they get a slap on the wrist. They do something, oh, we'll pay the million dollar fine. There are companies and organizations who can habitually violate every EEOC category you could think about, but they have such strong lawyers and teams behind them that they're like, mm -hmm. we'll pay the fine. We'll, we'll, yeah. keep, we'll keep harming black women. We'll keep being uh, biased against LGBTQ plus individuals. We'll keep being uh, exclusionary to, to people with dis disabilities because mm -hmm. they're like, eh, we have enough money, we could pay the fine. There's yeah. no real accountability. And what has our world taught us? The more money you have, the more you can get away with stuff. We've seen it in yeah. politics. We've seen yeah. it in sports. We've yeah. seen it in our government. We've seen it in healthcare. So it just reinforces the message. And psychologically, from that lens, now this becomes something that we wire in our brain. Mm -hmm. So now the connection with bad behavior and money to getting away with it is something that is now wired in our brains. It's why racism yeah. continues, right? It's why oppression yes. continues because the stakes aren't high enough for those that are doing it to stop. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and I appreciate what both of you said in terms of really humanizing what's happening in these systems, right? So the systems are made up of people who are making the decisions. It's not just devoid of the people, right? And so we have to recognize that part, but also you raise a good point in terms of, it's important for us not to vilify those in HR too, right? Because many times they don't have all the information and guess what? They may be harmed too in these toxic work environments. So we have to be mindful of that as well. And then something also that you said, Shar, was in terms of just because you're a member of a certain group, that does not exclude you from any blame or any responsibility in terms of engaging in toxic behaviors, right? So I know for me, a lot of the toxicity that I experienced was not by a white person or white people. Yeah, they were involved, but it was mostly by people of color. OK, so what does that mean? Right. So you can't say, well, I'm also this. So I can't No, you can do both. Right. You can be oppressive as well. OK, Absolutely. so curious when we when we ex have these encounters. Right. What what can we do to protect ourselves in these situations? Because you talked about, you know, it's so important for us to come into jobs with it being realistic, right? Not idealistic. Oh, this organization has this wonderful DEI statement or whatever, right? What What do you recommend in terms of as we come into jobs, the perspective to have, and what are the ways we can protect ourselves in these jobs as well? Yeah, yeah. Great question. So many thoughts. But one thing I want to go back to because Claire mentioned, and I want to give some context for anyone who's listening that may not know, Claire referenced the EEOC and specifically within the U.S., you know, and there that is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and they are responsible for enforcing federal laws that make it illegal to discriminate against job applicants and employees on the basis of like race, religion, color, you know, sex, including pregnancy, and some other areas too. So I just wanted to give context on what that, you know, what that meant. So you know, going back to your question in terms of what people can do, look. I've been black my whole life, right? And I've been taught and many of us have been, you know, to keep receipts. I'm telling mm -hmm. you as an HR prof professional, keep receipts. Like, mm. We need to be better. And this, I don't, I don't care if you're purple, black, or blue, like keep receipts, know what has happened. Even if you're just for yourself, writing it down. One, I think mm -hmm. that goes a long way because some people the cathartic release of writing it down or getting it out might be beneficial for them as they're processing it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Understanding that, when did this happen? Is this a pattern, right? Because going mm -hmm. back to the same EEOC, you know, a lot of times I will hear people say things and I want to just disclaimer, 
I am not an attorney. I wanted to be an attorney. I may still become an attorney, but I am not an attorney. But, you know, being in this field for almost two decades, you learn a thing or two about the law, right? Yes. So I want to just say to people, know what's happening, right? So think of it in the same way. If you go to a doctor and you say, I have not been feeling well for X amount of time, they're going to start asking you for a history. They're going to want to understand how long has this been happening? You know, if you're saying you're in pain, are there particular times where this pain is increased or decreased? Because they're going to try to pinpoint it, right? So Mm -hmm. they're going to ask you to keep a log if you don't know, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, someone, I've gone through this in terms of trying to figure out, well, what am I allergic to, right? And I remember the doctor saying to me, okay, keep a log of what you're eating. And when something goes wrong, write it down because then we Mm -hmm. can narrow it down or pinpoint what it was that caused that reaction. I'm telling yeah. people to do the same thing. Now, I'm not telling yeah. you to go out there and write a trilogy, you know, because mm-hmm. not everyone wants to do that. But even if it's, yeah. if you have access to a phone, because I don't want to presume that everyone does, you know, if pen and paper, voice note in something to yourself, you know, whatever method of capturing you can do or have someone else help you do, if you're unable to do that for yourself, do yeah. that so that you know. So I think that for me is one of the biggest things. Mm-hmm. Keep your receipts know Mm. what happened and when it's happened and i'll leave this to claire to explore more on but from a mental health perspective from what i've learned from claire right because i also want to just disclaimer there are many hr professionals that i've experienced in my life who have assigned themselves or been assigned the expertise of all the therapists no and i i've told people a lot wrong twin when they say things to me like oh you're there no 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 me listening to you go through your challenges or the issues does not make me a therapist. It just makes right. me a listener. And there's a distinction, yes. right? And Absolutely. I think that's something you need to understand. HR professionals yeah. are not licensed therapists. And if right. you happen to work in a company where an HR professional happens to be a therapist, they're if they're not employed as a therapist at that company, do not engage them or attempt to engage them in such a way, right? I think that's important, right? To understand and know your lane, because mm-hmm. if you're paying me to show up as someone in HR, even if I have other skills, that's not what I'm being paid for. So yeah. I'm going to show up and act in the manner that I'm being paid for. So yeah. all of that to say, keep your receipts and understand yeah. what's happening. And by the way, receipts also for what's happening within your own health and yeah. your own wellness. Because if you get to the point where you have to go to a doctor, they're going to want to know how long has this been happening and what's been happening. Yeah. yeah. You know, you raised something that was so important too, and I didn't even think about this. If HR professional is also a mental health professional, right, but they're in the capacity of an HR role, I think that that gives such a sense that people might perceive they can trust this person more and disclose certain things towards them, right? And I remember when I had S. S. Anne Marie Archer on, and she's also an HR, she's an HR consultant and an attorney. And she talked about be very mindful what you tell people in HR because that they can use that information against you. So I'm so glad you said that so that people listening know you don't tell all your business to people. You know what I'm saying? Thinking that, oh, they have a therapy background, it's okay to share. Mm-hmm. No, do not. Boundaries, do boundaries are important. Boundaries. But yes. I, I just want to clarify something. Mm-hmm. In my career, I have not met any HR professionals who are also therapists. What I'm saying is that people assume, or I've heard people Mm. just reference HR as the therapy department, and it's Ah. not not false. Yes. That's a myth. That's a misunderstanding. And that's a false narrative that, as a result of that false narrative, I believe causes a lot of harm, right? Absolutely. Now, I've also met many awful HR professionals throughout my career, and some people where Mm. I've just thought, wow, like how did this even happen? So I think mm. it's important to recognize that we, the discrimination, not even discrimination, the bias mindsets also come around departments. We have certain views of what it means to be HR, certain views of what it means to be IT, certain views of what it means to be a therapist. And because we are assigning those views, we're expecting people to respond and show up in that way. I yes. tell people all the time, I'm a business strategist. Business, Mm -hmm. operational, that's the stuff I love. I happen to do HR, happen to be darn good at it. And I'm Mm -hmm. but really I lean into business first. That's that's where it goes for me. So again, assuming that the HR person's a therapist, bad. But yes, you Mm -hmm. can talk to the HR person, but here's another tip. When you're having a conversation, before you just spill everything, right? 
-hmm. understand what they're going to do with it. One of the things mm -hmm. I always told people was mm -hmm. this, I mm -hmm. will protect your confidentiality to the best extent possible because mm -hmm. I never made assurances that I couldn't keep. Now that now mm -hmm. I know I'm a good, great HR professional. It doesn't mean that I'm running to say, oh, X, Y, and Z happened. But if I have to mm -hmm. investigate something or something's going on, certain things may be disclosed. For example, mm -hmm. if you and I had an issue, right, and mm -hmm. it was ongoing, and I then reported it, and mm -hmm. someone came to talk to you, if you know that I'm the only person that you've had this issue with, you are naturally going to assume it was me who reported it. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean that the HR person told you that. You're mm -hmm. a human fully capable of reason and logic for yourself. So right. that's the other thing to understand. Sometimes, depending on what's going on, if there's not many parties or witnesses to whatever has happened, mm -hmm then uh, people are just going to make assumptions and we can't, yeah. I can't change someone's assumptions. Just like I can't yeah. change someone's racism, their prejudice, their misogyny. I can't change that. I can't mm -hmm. change the assumptions or what they deduce based on what they believe. Right. So yeah. HR, everyone call not therapist. Yes. Not, even yes. For people who watch billions and saw Wendy Rhodes, you know, acting in that capacity, not therapists. And even if you have an HR person who also has a background in mental health, that is not the capacity they're showing up in. And for the yes. HR professionals who are on this call listening, please stop giving yourself licenses in mental health and trying to engage people in conversations through that lens when you are not skilled to do it. One of the yeah. most important things I've learned from my sister when, because I've gone to her when I'm like, I don't understand what this what is happening is that it is harmful when you are not credentialed, licensed, experienced, trained to open mm -hmm. up a box for someone, which could be their own trauma, and yeah. the, let them talk it out vain and yeah. not be equipped to handle that. So exactly. for professionals on this call or anyone, stop pushing people or pressing them to yeah. divulge everything. Yeah. Because if you are not equipped to handle that, you're actually causing more harm. And yeah. not HR professionals, this this can happen to friends within families. You know, we want to be supportive of each other. And yeah. the last thing I will say in terms of protect yourself, and you mentioned that you don't have to share everything, right? One of the things I've trained, I would train my teams on reporting into me. So if you're going to be out of the office, I just need to know you're not going to be here. You don't need mm -hmm. to justify it with what you're doing or why you're doing it. And many mm -hmm. times I've experienced employees feeling like, well, I think my manager wants an explanation for what, mm. why you're no, I'm not going to be available. We need to stop as people, mm -hmm. whether we are the person who is saying we're not going to be available mm -hmm. or the person on the receiving, receiving end of hearing that we need to stop mm -hmm. expecting that it needs a qualifier to justify the decision that another adult is making for themselves. Point taken, right? Boundaries, right? that we are aware of our own boundaries and also institutions be mindful of their boundaries in terms of employees. And also when you talked about, you know, if someone is sharing information with someone who's not a licensed mental health professional, they're sharing all these things, how that could be harmful. And the additional harm of that information being used against them, right? So that could be devastating to think that you trusted someone and they're using this information against you. And then also, Shar, you talked about keeping your receipts, right? I wrote that down. Keep your receipts, document, 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 document. And I remember when S. Henry Archer was on, she talked about the same thing about documentation. And I just thought about something too. A lot of times when we're in a toxic job, we start gaslighting ourselves, right? Like, what just happened? Am I tripping? Did that really happen? Right. And so I think when we document and we're able to see it in black and white, no, this did happen. Right. And particularly when you start seeing patterns, I think that will help in terms of your mental health too. So you're not self gaslighting yourself because you're probably going to be, you're probably getting gaslighting at the job. Right. But then to self gaslight takes it to another level. Right. Because then you start pushing yourself and if you can trust yourself, which can be very damaging. What about for you, Dr. Claire, in terms of the mental health aspect? What have you seen for, for people who've experienced this as well? And how can they, how can they protect themselves? I'm sorry. No, absolutely. I, I, I mean, Shari, if I, could have, if I had a tambourine, I'd throw it at the screen, girl, because I was like, church, church. Uh, you know, she's going to shake her head and tell me I'm always a mess, but you know. Um, but I think so much of what you said is part of the connection with our own wellness too, right? Receipts, yeah. 
But I also want to be clear that the burden of keeping receipts can also be something that is harmful. Because the mm. fact that you know that you have to expend this much energy mm. to now prove your experience, and then, yes, it can be cathartic for some people to just get it out, but it can mm. also be harmful for some people to constantly be reminded of the harms they're navigating. And yeah. so you have to find a way that balances it. Because... I will say one of the things I did learn from my sister was receipts. You know, as a clinician, we're trained to document, document, document. But that's mm -hmm. in terms of the clinical space. No one was like, you're going to have to document your experience in this job. And, mm -hmm. and, and I know that it can definitely be used against you. One of the things I've also learned is document outside of your company's server. Yes. Because that doesn't belong to you. And no, so you can get and they you use that. Yes, wants you to say that you are, you were, you were sending emails to yourself from their stuff. Copy and paste, like whatever yes. you know, like whatever it is. Like you need to be able to document outside of your company server. Please do not have a folder of receipts on your company's laptop computer server. Because guess right. what's going to happen? IT is going to accidentally be, be told to erase it. Or you right. will no longer have access to because you you do not want to put yourself in a position where all of that energy now is for not because now you're going to feel worse and you may or may never use it. But to the yeah. point, and I know we talked about this before, Dr. Kamani, about gaslighting yourself mm -hmm. because the, you know, even on chapter two, one of the blogs too was talking about the psychological safety and the fact that the psychological safety is a myth. There's mm. no such thing as psychological safety in a job. No, it will never be unless you are working for yourself by yourself and we can be harmful to our own selves because of the negative sure. self-talk. There's sure. no such thing as that psychological safety because what is safe to me is not safe to you. And you yeah. will never be able to create a system or a space that everybody feels safe. You can consistently yeah. work towards it. And that is the goal of inclusion so that people can feel a sense of belonging. You can consistently mm. retool the system and learn from your errors in the system and expand because the goal of, of, of inclusion is not us versus them. It's us, mm -hmm. them, and everybody else, right? It's not mm -hmm. where I feel better and you feel less or I have to erase myself so you feel better. It means that I can be myself and you too, right? Yeah. But it is important that you recognize that when we are in these systems that are yeah. created by the human beings mm -hmm. that may have a, a vested career, personal, whatever interest in protecting their own families and their own housing, protecting their own livelihoods, their mm -hmm. own families, their own children, if they have children, whatever their interests are, they're mm -hmm. going to be looking out for self. And you mm -hmm. have to be in a space where you're looking out for self as well. I would also mm -hmm. say it is important uh, to the point raised, and I want to definitely go back to the HR conversation around HR being presented as uh, mental health practitioners, because mm -hmm. I have seen that, and it has been very mm -hmm. frustrating to me. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think this also creates a distrust around HR, as well as even the fact yeah. that DEI is often housed in HR when people don't trust HR. So why would people trust mm -hmm. DEI, right? Right. Um, those things we need to, to understand. I have seen HR professionals because the reality is they are human. So let me take out HR. I have seen human beings who also happen to work in the HR space because of their own voyeurism and their mm -hmm. own voyeuristic needs, the de desire to get information from the employees that they don't need, and then mm -hmm. also use that against the employee to oust that employee. I have seen wow. people be aware, for example, this employee is a single mother, and, you know, uh, lives an hour and a half away from the work site. And now we have an audit coming up and you are aware of that because this employee shared with you the fact that they got a divorce and now they're living with their, their family and, you know, the, the, their, their, their mother or, or father is helping to do childcare. And, you know, once they get home, their, their, their mother or father leaves to go do a night shift. And so mm -hmm. they have to be home at a certain time. But now an audit came up. And because you are a cuckoo loco, not really nice, evil human being uh, in a leadership 
capacity, you now mm -hmm. use what you know about this employee against them because now it's like they're not a team player because you mm -hmm. want them to risk getting a child protective service case and staying late at work to help with your audit versus right. going with getting their child. And now that's used to fire them. But that's because you they talked about it. And so we have, yeah. I have experienced HR wanting information from me that they don't need to know, even at, at all, right? Like, I, I, mm -hmm. you don't need to know this. For, for what reason mm -hmm. do you, and, and I am quick to let people know, particularly when it comes to health or any of those mm -hmm. things, HIPAA laws, when it comes to uh, education records, FERPA laws, I am very quick to, dis to remind people about yeah. these. So one of the things I would also say beyond what Shars mentioned and the receipts and being mindful is, also knowing your rights we often yeah. give away our rights because we don't know our rights yes People yes take yes advantages of those those areas of our own ignorance and mm -hmm. you're you don't know what you don't know to look it up but mm -hmm. it is a it is a incumbent upon you to mm -hmm. just ask and i'm not necessarily asking whoever you deem as hr i always say google is free just like the library yes Yes, the yes. The library has a librarian who can help you with a lot more. So yes. go and use whatever resources you can if you have access to those things. If you have mm -hmm. access, because again, everyone is not privileged to have internet access and privileged to have technology and all these things. But I think it is important that we seek. Oftentimes, people are in a space where they have overshared. Mm. And then it's like, oh crap. And I've done it to myself, right? Because of that mm -hmm. trust. Because the point is, is that there's human and human resource title right there's a right here that we are innately wired for connection that's where yeah. we come from our mental health and our and our on our brain science piece right yeah. we are wired yeah. for connection we are wired for community if someone is engaging with you and asking you questions again you work with them for three four five six fifteen years you think that they care for you but mm -hmm. i want to be clear can you make lifelong friends at work absolutely Mm -hmm. But they're not your friends and family. Please right. treat your job and your colleagues like your friends and family. They don't. Yes. If, if you so choose, and if it does, genuine, genuine friendships can be developed. But people, mm -hmm. because of their desire for closeness, often mistake collegial mm -hmm. relationships with mm -hmm. intimate relationships, and then mm -hmm. therefore give colleagues access to a level of intimacy mm -hmm. that should only be reserved for those people in your life who have shown themselves worthy of that access to you and then when that damage comes when that betrayal comes it's now worse because it's connected to your livelihood it's connected yes. to being able to feed your family it's connected yes. to housing right yeah these are the things and i and i i caution people and again i've had to learn the hard way uh Char and i have talked so much about these things over the years it's why chapter two even came up or why it was created because I, from government and nonprofit sector, was going to her like, can you believe this and this happened? I cannot believe this. And she, from her corporate lens, was like, and this happened. And we were just like, wait a minute. So it doesn't matter if you're a nonprofit or for a profit. It's still a hot mess. Yeah. And yeah. people don't understand the importance of the talent experience and by talent experience, the human experience. We yeah. are who we are. And how we show up in the workplace is because of who we are outside of the workplace. Mm -hmm. And if... Mm -hmm. The leadership and others in companies refuse to acknowledge that it impacts their bottom line. And that's part of the lens that chapter two has. But also mm -hmm. understanding you have to protect yourself mm -hmm. in a way that saves your sanity and your physical well-being. You don't have to go to the after work events. I don't drink alcohol. And I have and I am very well aware yeah. that a lot of the events and workspaces happen outside of hours, right? I'm not invited to those things. I don't drink alcohol. Can I miss opportunities? Yes. But here's the thing. You're not going to get me in that space where people lower their guard and now can, I'm already a black woman living in America. I have enough stereotypes against me, right? I'm yes. not navigating that space. I know I can come off as very extroverted, but yeah, I promise you I am an ambivert. I am the most extroverted introvert I know. <laughs> I need to also recharge. I don't. No, you don't get my time after hours. But I also know that even things like that have been used to harm people in the workspace, right? And it wow. could be HR is at the, oh, well, they, 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 they don't show up. You don't know if this person has for religious reasons, i.e. they may be Muslim and they don't drink alcohol, or for personal reasons, like may have uh, just personal choice not to drink alcohol, or maybe uh, in sobriety, or, or, you know, all of these different, or just don't want to hang out with you. Yeah. But we make all these assumptions. So I, I'm using that to get to my last point. 
consider and mitigate the times you're spending with work outside of work. Stop giving people so much access to you that they can catch you slip. Stop giving people so much access to you that they see you in all these different spaces and think they know you and have a familiarity with you because that's just a part of you. And a lot yeah. of times people drop their guard mm -hmm. and they're just, and that is where the harm. So be mindful of what you're saying. HR yes. is not, is not uh, therapy. Yeah. Uh, document what you have to say. Limit how much you are engaging outside of your workspace and hours mm -hmm. so that you can also protect your own wellness and maintain those boundaries mm -hmm. and stop oversharing. If you need to talk to someone and vent, the difference with HR and a therapist, mm -hmm. HR is under no obligation to keep what you said confidential, but mm -hmm. a therapist is legally bound and professionally and ethically bound to maintain mm -hmm. your privacy outside of emergencies where you want to harm yourself, harm someone else, or where it would pose a eminent public health threat. Those mm -hmm. are the three times that we can't keep something secret. Right. And a therapist is there for your best interests, right? A therapist is relatively objective and really trying to help you, right? You have that investment, you have that established relationship in terms of boundaries. HR, that's not the same thing. So we have to be clear about the role of HR. I think yes. we get it mixed up because yes. many times we've been brought up to say, oh, you have a problem, go to HR, go to HR, right? Mm -hmm. But I think we are demystifying really what HR really is. And I think yeah. that's really yeah. important. Yeah. 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 And I don't and want, then, just, to, just to add Dr. K, if I may, uh -huh. Yes. I don't want people to think that they can't go to HR, that HR is this bad, big, bad, you know, wolf. It's, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that at all. In mm -hmm. every single organization, in every single department, you're going to find good people, mm -hmm. mad people, and bad people. That's just yes. life. It doesn't matter yeah. what discipline or department or what you do. That's just how the cookie crumbles in life. Mm -hmm. Specifically speaking, though, about HR, because, again, don't want to give it a bad rep. You're, to your point, they're they are looking out for different interests. Mm -hmm. well, employees in HR... I, and I stayed, stated employees because I want to highlight that first. Are employees of the company? Yes. Just yes. like you. So if yes. you come to me to complain about the benefits plans, and by the way, I think about a lot of the issues that people just don't understand HR, we could probably do a whole different talk on that in terms of what is HR actually? What is this function responsible for doing? Because as a discipline, HR has over 20, 30 different specialty areas. No one's going to be an expert in all of that. But because mm -hmm. a lot of things fall under the HR umbrella, which is a very vast umbrella, there's a lot of missed, mismanaged expectations and hurt because there wasn't clarity around what should I be getting, what should I expect, right? So specific to HR, HR is really there to help guide and usher the employee experience, the full life cycle. When I say full life cycle, I mean from the recruitment process to when the person ends. And what are the systems, tools, policies, processes, et cetera, in place to help support that? But it also is aligning back to organizational goals or a good HR department understands how to link the people strategy with the organizational strategy, right? So how do we activate and motivate based relative to the development of our people and the experience of our people in alignment to what the organization is saying that its goals are, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Claire mentioned, and I wanted to just highlight this too, mm -hmm. that, you know, the we talked about the receipts, we talked about different things, but the other thing too to be mindful of is there are laws in the same way that you are licensed professionals and licensed mental health practitioners and you are governed by laws, there are laws that are governing workplace experiences or what, what can or cannot happen, right? Specific mm -hmm. to the US, we mentioned the EEOC, mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of others, but in other countries. So when you talk about what are things people can do, educating yourself is beyond taking receipts. Are you aware of what you're, if you're in the US, federal, state, and local, so it might be city, rights are relative to being an employee? Claire mentioned mm -hmm. Google is free. Right now, I understand a lot of information can be confusing, but for those on the call or just anyone in other countries, or if you decide I want to be an expat, I want to go going abroad, make sure you are clear on what the laws are relative to employment in, in those countries. You know, for example, in Germany, you can take three, three years, your job 
is going to be protected, right? Like once you wow. have it, right? And there's other countries have different laws, right? And so do you know what your rights are extends beyond let me keep a receipt. Mm. And I'm not telling people to just overly write. It's just know yourself well enough to know, mm, I probably want to take a note of this, right? It's like insurance. Yes, right. Have it. But <laughs> yeah. When you're talking specifically about you know, the experience and how to change some of those things. The biggest issue that I've personally seen is that people don't understand, one, what HR is supposed to do when we're talking about the company, and two, they do not understand what their rights are. Mm. You know, going back, focusing on the U.S. for a second, mm -hmm. people talk about at-will employment, which means that for any reason, as long as it's not discriminatory, a company can terminate your employment with or without cause. Right. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. only state that is not at will in this country, well, fully at will is Montana. So we so over 70 percent of people within the U.S. are at will employees, whether or not they know it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a union, no, likely not because of collective bargaining agreements or some other areas like some federal jobs. But you are an at will employee more likely than not. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Do you understand that? So when people are like, I can't believe they term, did you, I had an employment contract. No, no. That's the other thing people don't understand. An offer letter outlines the terms. An employment contract is a more detailed, secure, legally binding document, which delves into specificity around what you, what will or will not happen or dictate your employee experience in many ways. For example, if you were to leave, we have to give you three months severance, right? Mm -hmm. That that's a that's a contract. If you're signed again, it's more a legally binding document. And I've heard people often conflate. I got an offer letter and use the term employee contract. Those are not the same things. So when we're mm -hmm. talking about education as a means to empower, protect yourself. So we talked about protecting your your wellness and your wallet. Understand yeah. what your rights are. There are a yeah. lot of attorneys, employment attorneys. Mm -hmm. in or outside the U.S. who may offer free consults just to understand what's going on mm -hmm. to find out whether or not you have something that would be of interest of them to take you on as a client. I wish mm -hmm. more people, especially the more, you know, senior roles that you may be going into would say to themselves, before I sign this offer letter or employee contract, let me speak to an attorney to make sure I'm aware of these rights. Do you know uh -huh. whether or not when you sign an, a, an offer letter from a company that if an issue arises, whether you have the right to sue them through open court or whether or not you're forced into a binding uh, arbitration, right? Which mm. is completely different. A lot of times people don't know this. When these things are being found out, we are at high stress, high tense moments and mm. all the chaos is ensuing. So yeah. why I'm saying document is because if you're documenting things when it's like little annoying not flying around when something bigger happens if it happens you have something to go back to instead of trying to get your brain in a stress response to mm. now go through this stuff so again yeah know your rights speak yeah. to employment lawyers understand especially for city or state right so federally minimum wage in the u.s is one is one thing but new mm. york city where I live is $15 an hour, right? Or a little bit more. I can't remember exactly right now, but whatever the law is that applies to where you are, that's the one that takes precedence. So sometimes a city law or a local law is more favorable to you than a, the federal law. So make sure you are aware of these things because when you are not, that's how people are, for lack of better terms, running game on you because you yes. don't know. So be informed, be informed, yes. right? Yes. Get the resources, consult, yeah. be informed. Okay. Yeah. Get clarity. Okay. Because just be because, you because you saw it on Google doesn't mean it's right. Yeah. It's because you did a web search, right? So yeah. <laughs> speaking from a recovering WebMD aholic, I have diagnosed <laughs> myself with many things because I have just said, oh, well, this and this is that. No. Yeah. This is why you can go and do some research, maybe mm -hmm. get some insight of potential, but then you mm -hmm. get with an expert. To yeah. confirm that for you. Yes, yes, yes. And being okay with doing that, right? Because yes. sometimes we do need to consult with an expert. Now, but do, do it when it's easy. Yes. When I'm so, yes. Yes. the easiest time to establish a relationship or, or start doing things is when we're in the honeymoon phase. 
That's mm. the easiest time. When you wait, when you're in a stress situation, you're not really showing up as your best. So upfront, talk to people, whether it's your colleagues, HR manager, leader. Hey, how do I share observations with you? Mm. How do you like to receive I don't like the word feedback, so I call it observations because people freak out at that word. You know, how do I give you praise? How do I know when you're shutting down? We need to have these conversations up front when yeah. we are in honeymoon kumbaya land yeah. instead of waiting until when something goes wrong. So yes. have those conversations up front. Document what you can for yourself. I'm not saying yeah. you're like, oh, I have a list. But more yeah. importantly, please just understand what your rights are. Mm. Mm -hmm. No, you're right. And like you all said to document, but not on company. <laughs> so many people do that. Or they have all their family photos or personal things on the company computer. Then they get terminated and they're like, I need all of this stuff. Just know a company's not obligated to give you that because you mm. access in that and do it. That's their stuff. I know mm. you're thinking it's yours. I have never signed up for any emails, flyers or anything using company email. Even check, even check in personal email on company equipment. I can count how many times I've ever done that in my career. I don't do it. The company laptop, I'm only doing company business on that. Mm -hmm. Strictly. Yes. Yeah. So be mindful of that. Everybody listening. Okay. So I just want to go over some of the comments before we go on. I'm glad to be listening today. So relatable. That's the heavy truth regarding no organizations being safe. It's an aspiration. The gyms are gymming. Um, there's also the do more with less policies that increase workload for employees, punish or fire managers that are protective of their staff. The higher ups hire those managers that lead by inducing fear. Mm, yeah, I've definitely, yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Oh, wait, it's a lot of comments. Hold on one second. Um, let's see. Um, the way these tech companies are laying off people is beyond the pale. This is unchartered territory and human relations. It's inhumane, literally. Yes, people keep saying to document everything and it's just too much to relive the trauma of the day. Um, preach, know your rights and don't overshare. Yes, know your rights. What is support available to you? Know your rights, know your rights. That's about HR, OMG, after work events. I recently attended an after work event to build my network and met my new team. Two weeks later, I received a call from employee relations requesting information, right? So yeah, uh, um, uh, let's see. So just be mindful of what information we share. An altercation between two employees, they thought I was a witness and I vowed to never attend an after work event again, okay? Great topic. Absolutely, HR has to look out for the company's interests. Had a horrible experience with HR. I had a stress-induced experience. I ended up retaining an attorney. Uh, ooh, this is good. I've had leaders say that I'm antisocial because I didn't go to the happy hour and or dinner with my colleagues. I am an HR professional, but I'm a little different as I support the employees. I know how HR can trap people. Um, mm -hmm. Found an employment attorney, very helpful. Um, excellent. True about documenting. I've taken notes and re record my stories. Yeah. Very helpful with a narcissistic manager. Um, this is a true masterclass. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. So just a lot of appreciation, um, right? First, thank yes. you. I'm so glad everyone's yes. getting something out of this. Yeah. Yes. yes. Absolutely. So, so when we think about, you know, we've talked about what we've seen. We've talked about you know, different ways we could try to protect ourselves. I think it's also helpful to really kind of put it out there. What are some of the observable behaviors that you know you're even in a toxic work environment, right? So we talked about earlier about the self gaslighting, right? Mm -hmm. So from your perspectives, what are some of the things that you have seen or heard or that you're like, okay, this is, this is toxic? So it's, Great that this came up. And I, I saw this on LinkedIn and knowing that we were um, having this conversation, I think it's like Planet New or something. It says 10 signs that show your work culture is toxic. And I think I shared it with you on when we were back and forth and planning with this. And, you know, 
uh, one, so I'm going to go through them really quickly, but not all of them. Blame is the first solution. You know, um, you know, unmanageable and unrealistic expectations. One of the comments, and I think the, the person that talked about this more with less, as someone who's worked in nonprofit and government my whole career, the concept of more or less is one that I'm like, just, just can we stop? Like, we have exhausted that to the level of exhaustion no more. Um, mm -hmm. it, is, it is abusive. It is so important that we recognize that all of these things are abusive because the expectation that you work for free and that you are harmed is the vestiges of slavery. Yes. That, that just to be clear, capitalism is what drove slavery. Mm -hmm. And we still have very capitalistic mindsets, you know, think of Karl Marx and 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 these and the theorists that gave us these ideas and this information years ago. That mm -hmm. is what's driving it. So when you have that expectation, unrealistic and un, un, no, um, you need to check your emails and be available 24 seven. I always say Fortune 100 companies, Fortune 500 companies or Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 companies before Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter and email was created. And somehow yeah. without 24 hour access, without you having a cell phone. Yeah. Somehow continue to thrive because many of these companies were thriving in the 40s, 50s and 60s that are still doing well today. Some of them are no longer in existence. But if they were able to survive and figure out how to become global influences without being able to call you while you are at dinner with your family, mm. why do you feel you're that important? You're not. People will do what you allow. Another sign of toxic workspace, when you're afraid of your boss, afraid to speak to your boss. I want to caution, though that sometimes this is not necessarily always because of the way the boss is, but because of the perception. Whether is it, are you assuming because your boss is a black woman that she's angry and aggressive? Mm. Are you assuming because your, your boss is uh, part of the LGBT community that they only care about those issues? Mm. Are you assuming that because your boss has a child with um, a neuro, it's that, that a neuro, who that's, classified as neurodivergent, that they can't understand who you are because that's all their lens. Like we have a lot of assumptions and those also based on our culture, the way we were raised, our gender identity, expression, religious identity, all of those different things that shape who we are. So I think it is important, but also don't gaslight yourself too, right? So balance, right? right? You know, yes. you have a lot of anxiety. I've talked to people and even myself, you know, no motivation to get up and go to work. Mm. You're dreading, you're dreading Sunday night. I mean, if, yeah, if, if you work, if you work in a U.S., a tr traditional, you know, Monday to Friday schedule, right? Mm -hmm. Recognizing everybody doesn't do that. If yes. you have anxiety when you have to go into meetings, if mm. you are having physical reactions, like your stomach is hurting, your head is hurting, you're, you're nauseous, your palms are sweaty, all of these types of things. If you're not sleeping, sometimes we have other physical manifestations of, 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 of dis-ease in the body as a result, right? Yeah. Um, if yelling and screaming is a default, like I tell my team, the only time we're yelling and screaming is if something positive happened. Like, oh my gosh, <laughs> we got a bomb dress, let's yell and scream. <laughs> you want tickets to the basketball game you want to go to, we are jumping up and down. But my approach is never going to be yelling and screaming at anyone. For yeah. what? Yeah. For yeah. What? what is the purpose? But yeah. those are some of the signs. But one of the things also is, and I say this as a, as, a lead as when I got into leadership, one of the things I did was be what I didn't have. And so mm. I apologize to my staff. Mm. I own, you know what? I'm sorry. I dropped the ball on this. I completely forgot. I give mm. credit when people tell me, oh, you're, this is such a great idea. I'm like, you know what? Such and such had this idea. I will let this. That's the mic. Like, oh my gosh, you know what? Oh, they are so bomb. They are dope. I, yeah. Because you don't, need that because I was told, you know, this person's going to take credit. You have to accept this. So when you have a work environment where people take credit for your work, where they don't acknowledge you, where you're left out of the conversations, where you're dreading, where you have anxiety, where your family members are like, can you please quit that job? Where your doctor's like, can you please quit that job? My doctor included, like all of those things, that's yes. toxic workspace. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what are you guys talking about this too? Let's try to give you one minute. What are you got to talk about this in terms of relational issue, right? So in terms of how these toxic jobs impact us, not only ourselves, right, physically, spiritually, psychologically, but relational. It impacts those who are in relation with us. 
because they see us being harmed and it harms them as well, right? So mm -hmm. Dr. Nadia Lopez talks about that, right? In terms mm -hmm. of after her daughter, her mother. So for us to keep in mind also, that's how you now you could tell the job is toxic also, is that other people close to you, they're being impacted as well. So Shar, I'm sorry, I just wanted no, to- No, 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 that, that's good. And it's interesting. That's one of the points I'd written down because how do you know? Yeah. People who actually know you, value and love you will tell you. I cannot tell you how many times I've had conversations with managers or leaders like, oh, this person is a problem. And what people don't understand is that if they're coming to me as HR, I have their perspective, lens and view, and they've already built this thing about you in their mind already. Right. Mm -hmm. I will say 80 percent of the time, if the HR professional is good enough and and just is doing what they should be doing to get mm -hmm. information to understand the other side. I have usually found that it wasn't just the thing the manager was saying was going on, was that was going on, right? Uh -huh. Maybe the employee didn't feel like they were getting the tools or the resources that they needed to be successful. They were being left out of things. They weren't yeah. invited to the after hour events because maybe they, you know, people just assume, you know, I've, you know, I had a friend who was Jewish and the, the stories that I've heard about the exclusion experience because of shutting down, you know, to observe the religious, um, observations that needed to happen, that's really damaging to people too. And we need to acknowledge that, you know, yeah. people who are parents not being given opportunities because the assumption is that, well, they have a child, so they wouldn't be available. So let me not even have a conversation with them. Right. So when you're talking about signs, it, yes, it can look like withdrawal, but it can look very different based on the individual person. Right. So yeah. am I more withdrawn? Am I maybe more hyper? Am I demanding to be in more meetings, you know, because something is missing if I now am exhibiting an extreme response. And we miss a lot of signs because someone now doing a whole bunch of extra work or mm -hmm. working 13, 14, 15 plus hours, we're praising that and not saying, wait a minute, not only what's happening that this is the type of stuff that this person feels they need to do in terms of working like this, but mm -hmm. is there something they're trying to prove, right? Mm -hmm. Do they feel like they're not valued? So if I do more, I'm going to be valued because let's be real. Many people, because people are organizations, value the activity over the achievement versus the achievement yes. over the activity, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. if it took me two hours to do something and it, then that's not as good or per potentially perceived as good as someone who may have spent 13, 14, 15 hours because they worked harder. Well, what if yeah. my experience and my lens of expertise means that because I've built a career for 20 years, what's taken you 13 hours to do because you have three or four years of experience took me an hour and a half to at most because I have two decades of experience, right? Right, These are right. That we need to like balance and acknowledge and recognize because- yeah. Everyone is going to show up differently, but specific to workplace, you know, what I've seen and what I've challenged managers are, oh, this person is not performing. What does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. What does performance mean? Because miscommunicated expectations will always lead to disappointment. Absolutely. That and, you know, you talked about the one side of perception of a so-called difficult employee, right? So, oh, this employee isn't difficult, difficult, but Right. Was this employee trained appropriately? Did we express the uh, expectations appropriately to the employee? Right. Is there something going on personally? Not that we need to dive it, into it. Right. But right. that could be influencing. Right. There's a yes. woman I can think of years ago. Her mother was dying of cancer and she worked to have different mm -hmm. schedule. But when I tell you every almost everyone on that team was in their feelings like, oh, just she's leaving at X or Y, Z time. Well, yeah, she's leaving at three, but she's here at seven and you don't roll in until 930 or 10. So she's right. gotten three hours ahead of you before you even get here. Right. And she's right. not close to what she's going through. So I also think leaning in with a lot more grace, stopping the assumptions, asking yes. clarifying questions, but yes. also being OK if someone's not giving you the detail that you want. I do not owe mm -hmm. you a deep explanation about what's going on in my life. So, exactly. you know. Again, I don't want HR to get a bad rep. What I really want people to understand is that HR is made up of human beings who themselves yes. possess different intersectional identities, who themselves yes. are employees at the company are having to balance that. The company, yes. even if it's not HR, and this has happened to me several times, as an HR leader and professional, I have many times advised to organizations, other people, even when I was in the C-suite, others, 
I am not recommending that we take this strategy. Here are all the things that I see wrong with this. My role is risk advisement and mitigation. But if you decide to make the decision to do what I've advised you not to do. So if your doctor tells you, you know, you really need to stop doing X because it's impacting your health. They're mm-hmm. giving you the information. You have to decide whether or not you're going to take that. It's the same thing. So sometimes right. people think, well, HR did. No, HR is not making these decisions. I don't yeah. make decisions to fire people. Someone yeah. else has made that decision. And I'm in the room for legal reasons to make sure that things go the way it's supposed to. I don't hire. I've never hired anyone unless they work for me. Mm-hmm. Unless someone is on my team, I've never made a compensation decision for someone else. Now, my role, if I'm in, if I'm invited to those conversations about compensation for the organization, I want to do a deep dive and assessment to say, where are these dollars going? And me personally, I'm going to look at how that's impacting people from marginalized communities, whether or not there's they're receiving less percentage increase. Right. But even mm-hmm. if I point that out. Ultimately, someone else may say, well, I want to leave it alone. I've done Mm. my part. I've advised you, but I can't force you leader, you know, whether it's CEO or, or CFO or whatever, I can't force you to make that change. So I want people to understand HR is not making the decisions. Their role is to support decisions that are made and to advise where they see challenges or potential risks but they are not ultimately responsible for the decision. So a lot yes. of times HR is being blamed for things that they're not involved in and don't have the responsibility to yeah. that they be, are held accountable for. Yeah. So in, in the sense that, you know, HR is part of a system, right? So yes, one or two people, whatever, with HR are not making the final decision. And as you all have emphasized, human resources is made up of people. Right. So people, some are good, some are not so good. Right. So they may be coming in with their own flavor of it. Right. But that doesn't necessarily mean that all of HR is bad. Right. So we just have to keep that in mind. So wondering, you know, and I'm, I'm keeping track of these comments. They are just wow. Wait, let me let me read you guys the comments. These are some new comments that came in. Right. Um, because I think that you know, what's interesting is that, and this is actually leads to my next question. A lot of people have experienced harm by HR, right? And so there's this, there's this image or this um, very painful, you know, experience, right? So let me see, let me, let me go up a little bit. Um, So there was one comment in terms of, um, let me see. Okay. Um, in my experience, it's nepotism. I work for an organization that was or is still festered in nepotism. I witnessed qualified Black people getting rejected from referrals, but school, I think it was like nepotism, like school friends, you know, helping each other out, um, absolutely impacts the entire family. Thanks for acknowledging that. My job's HR is doing the devil's work. That was profound. Right. I I can see it. But even for that comment, and I want to acknowledge what that person is going through, right? Mm -hmm. They are employees too. So if I am having to think about how am I going to take care of my family, you know, I'm you know, do I am I gonna have health insurance, especially in the US, you know, job, a job of paycheck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if they may I have I have the more senior I got, I'm not going to say the less I cared, but the more bold I was with, this doesn't make any sense to me. I mm-hmm. do not support it. But if you want to execute on this, I, I am going to respect your decision. Right. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. that just came with just yeah time, wisdom, experience. Right. Mm-hmm. But they're being told to execute against certain things. Right. And someone also made a comment about tech. It's not mm-hmm. just tech. What's mm-hmm. in the news well, is not. Tech. Right. Yeah. These, these types of layoffs and things happen all the time and they've been going on. What's yeah. happened in the last few years, just as we see in our, with many other things that come to the forefront, is that the technology that we have now, access to our phones, you know, access to post something on Twitter or Instagram really quickly, TikTok, it's putting it in your face more frequently. But these things have always been happening. The only thing that has changed is that we now have new vehicles, which are faster to do this. You know, when my, if a friend of mine has a baby, I might send my mom a picture with friend permission, of course, 
you know, and she will say, oh, my goodness, I don't understand. In my day when we had kids, we wrote a letter and it arrived three weeks later. Aww. Now these kids are coming just fresh, fresh in the world. And there's a camera in their face and less than five minutes of being born. People know what yeah. they look like. So right. the speed of which we're able to do things. So the vehicles have changed, but these things have been happening forever. Tech yeah. has been an attention, but I can tell you the reason why we're in this right now is capitalism. And that's not just mm -hmm. tech drove mm -hmm. greed to a level that is bananas, right? Yeah. And, and people yeah. are making decisions based on, ooh, what if one of my stock value, my shareholders, whatever that's going to be, if I yeah. drive this things. I spoke to a really good friend over the weekend and I said this to him, you know, if I think about phones, and I'm not going to name any models, but where we were from the first or second iteration of something versus now, there was a huge technological, you know, changes. Innovation mm -hmm. versus iteration are different. Mm. So if I'm iterating on something, my horizon or my margin for expansive dollars may not be great because I'm just making better, right? My phone can do mm -hmm. everything right now. So other than my phone now being able to become the Jetsons and Rosie showing up and making breakfast for me, what is it that it can't do? Right. And that's the thing that we need to be mindful of. There's there's not much room for significant advancement in some areas. So same thing with HR. We're working mm -hmm. within the systems that exist. So yeah. for you as an individual, what are the systems that exist within you and what are the tools that you have access to to be able to engage in a way that best supports your needs? I will tell you, I've never heard anyone, self-included, and by the way, the most harm I've experienced in workplaces has been by HR and more often than not black HR, right? Ooh. So I think that's something that we need to acknowledge too. It doesn't, yeah. I'm not excluded from that. And the yeah. root of it, when someone sees someone get to a senior level, I remember as I was rising up the ranks, you know, I would have employees of color. It didn't matter if they were black. Any employee of color just saying, okay, I see you here. And they assumed that that meant things were gravy and they weren't because I'm working to protect you and buffer uh, you while I am being harmed because I'm sitting in these rooms as the only person of color, often the youngest person in the room too, because mm -hmm. I was at those levels, you know, based, based on working and listening to people make decisions about people that I know are based in bias. And I'm the only one calling it out. I mean, and people mm -hmm. just being so comfortable, maybe sometimes forgetting I'm in the room where they're just letting everything hang out and fly, right? So wow. being in HR hasn't saved me from harm. Yeah. Because the world experiences and sees me first and foremost as a black woman. Yes. And that it doesn't matter what the title is. It doesn't matter the title. And you will yes. get humbled really quickly when you mm -hmm. think that your title carries any weight because you yes. will be reminded of that. You know, yep. there are many famous people of color who've talked about what their experiences with the police officers have been, or, and I'm not bashing police officers, or what their experiences in workplace has been, or what their experiences in terms of discrimination has been. You know, I think Viola Davis recently wrote about or spoke about why her own production company, right? I wasn't getting what I needed to get done going through the other lens. So if the method you are trying in the workplace is not working for you, mm -hmm. try something else. Yeah, we all know what the yes. definition of insanity is. Try yes. something else. Yes. And just to be clear again, that everyone in HR are not bad, no. right? And that they everyone in the finance insanity. isn't, everyone in IT isn't, right? Right. So we can't make generalizations. That's all I'm saying, right? And Perfect. to recognize those who are in HR, many times they're being harmed too. I've had a lot of people in HR, a lot yeah. of black women in HR come to me. And they're like, I've been terrorized, you know, in HR. And I'm like, wow, like I thought, right? But many times we don't know. We don't know, right? And I just really want to normalize that these toxic work experiences happen across profession, yep. across age, around the world for Black women. OK, so just to be very clear about that. And that's why we're having these conversations to not only talk about that it happens, but also talk about ways that we heal and ways we can protect ourselves and mm -hmm. having a different perspective. I think it's very important and knowing our rights and knowing what to do. Um, let me see some other comments. OK, so they were talking about the nepotism was with high school uh, besties. 
It was a very easy process to secure roles. It was so disgusting and demoralizing. Wow, this is my ex-manager, 10 plus years doing this, but hired me knowing the job description was like zero to two years experience. Um, insane, always know your worth, never feel the need to ne negotiate your worth with anyone. You've been worth and always been worth it. Um, miscommunicated expectations. It's always leads to disappointment. This, um, let me see. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. Uh, you are so correct. Correct. We advise, but don't make the final decision, but oftentimes we get blamed because the leaders, managers fail to communicate to the employees, their decision, which in turn gives HR a bad reputation. Yeah. Facts. I got burned out by being an HR manager generalist trying to fight for employees who in turn blame me for everything. It's tough on both sides. Yes, yeah, sitting in HR protecting the rights of the employee while I was being harmed. That was my experience as the only black upper level manager in HR. So this really resonates with people, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad that we're having this conversation. So as we're winding down, yep. you know, and I've, and I've talked about this um, in previous videos I've done, particularly with um, at Henry Archer too, is that part of what I've been like baffled by, and I think part of it because I'm like a mental health professional, so I'm always trying to say, well, why, why, why? In terms of when these things are happening at these jobs, right? A lot of times with these workplace bullies, right? Because many times a the bully, they'll go from person to person to person to person, and everybody at the job knows that they're a bully. How is this possible? <laughs> How are these bullies able to just run rampant and continue to harm people within the workplace? What is HR's role with that? Because I'm just baffled by that. Yeah, how do you ask with that? And then Claire would love your perspective from the mental health lens as well. And with just your experiences at the intersection of health and social and racial justice. So What's happening? Short answer, the company values that person more than they value you. Th th that's it. So if you're in a relationship where you are not being honored, mm -hmm. you have to decide whether or not you want to keep that. Because Maya Angelou said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Absolutely. And what I see people doing is because gaslighting happens and we do it to ourselves, it's starting to justify or maybe this is not what they No, they meant what they said mm. and if you listen to them and believe them the first time mm -hmm. potentially you may have a different view right so yes. the, and i've had these conversations i've had leaders tell me well this person produces more they her output or the client likes them more or you know client always requests them or they're able to do this 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 and this as people mm. right and this is where i lean on claire we rank things right? We, we really do. We are quick to judge someone else to say, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're doing X and not recognize them. Well, there's three fingers pointed back on ourselves about Y, Z, P, Q, you know, it's more than three, obviously, but all the things that maybe we need to work on. It's very easy, you know, when to say to someone, oh, I would never do X, Y, and Z. You don't know what you're going to do until you're in the situation. Mm, and yeah. You just don't. So yeah. I think people have to be mindful, but really yeah. recognize that what it means is that whoever's making that decision, whether it's the leader, your manager, there's a higher value. And I, I don't want to say why, because I don't know what that person's reason is, that they are placing over you as an individual and your experience than they do over the offended, you know, that, and so they value the offended party more than they value you or your experience. And I think that's what we have to recognize. Sometimes it's that they don't want to deal with it. But when you talk about workplace bullies, when I've been in places where people have been out of control, they were mm -hmm. not secretive about it. They became bullies because there was it was OK to do what they were doing and it kept going on. Excuses being made or they didn't even get taps, tap like taps. Right. So right. as organizations, as people, you know, a lot of times people are talking about accountability. And what I really want people to walk away with is defining what that means for you as an individual, because. What you may think holding someone accountable means may not be what I as a leader or someone that you're looking to hold someone accountable means or looks like for me. So again, yeah. communication expectations will lead to disappointment. And yeah. also we need to focus on 
outcomes-based accountability, like not what I intended. So I didn't intend to say something racist. I didn't intend to, intend to say something sexist or prejudice, mm. or I didn't intend to show my bias. Mm. Well, we need mm -hmm. to focus on outcomes-based accountability, not what the yeah. person intended to do. So the impact, right. The impact. So not the intent, the impact. Intent, not, I mean, sorry. Yes, impact, impact. Not, not intent. Yes, yes, yes. So that's that's powerful, right? So they just value the bully more for whatever reason, right? Okay. Maybe you accept it. So when I did my dissertation, my area of research was bullying. And, you know, it was focused on childhood bullying, particularly uh, adolescents uh, of Caribbean descent, because we're mm -hmm. not studied. But what I saw was as I looked into workplace bullying, it was the very similar thing. Ignorance about what it was and a lack of accountability and minimizing the impact. Because to the point, if someone says, gee, the senior vice president of this company is who there's a problem with, but this person is bringing in, uh, you know, $50 million a year and we're paying this employee $100,000 a year, we could take that $100,000 loss, but we don't want that $50 million loss. Wow. And, but it continues because what it does is reinforces to the senior vice president that that is acceptable. Yeah. And what yeah. you do then is get the drain of the other colleagues who start leaving. And now they take that knowledge. Rather, dealing with that $50, ish, $50 million issue because the team that you have can bring you in $200 million, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's the trade-offs. It's the trade-offs. Yeah. It's also human nature to like the same stuff, right? We are creatures of habit no matter what. We want to be comfortable. Many of us don't like conflict. We don't want to upset people. We Cultural values, gender, all these different things. And mm -hmm. so that shapes it. And the other piece is a lot of times uh, we as individuals and employees are disempowered the experience of trauma, the compounded trauma, you know, there's been research stuff talking about the fact that it takes on average 22 months to recover from a toxic yeah. job. And yeah. I often say to people, and particularly uh, as a black woman and an immigrant, what does a lifetime of trauma take to recover from in the workplace? Because mm. I have yet to work in a job where mm. I have not been harmed. I am mm. still waiting for the job. And I identify as Christian. So I have now gone to the space of when I meet Jesus, that's when I will not be harmed. That's the only level now at this point for me because I have, and I've been in nonprofit that's supposed to be helpful. I've been in healthcare that's supposed to be helpful. And I have been incredibly harmed to the point of impacting my life, my life. Mm. And so yeah. we have to understand to Shar's point where the value judgments are made. But yeah. also the fact that that fear and control and many uh, people who may have uh, ill intent are aware of that because you yeah. are worried about your job. And so now you believe I can't get another job. Oh, it's yeah. going to be difficult. I'm going to be blackballed. It's going to be really hard. And sometimes you're broken in many ways. You're broken. Yeah. The, market, the market is challenging. Maybe you've been applying yeah. to a job for a year and you're not hearing anything back. And mm -hmm. so it's reinforcing to you that you're not good enough and yeah. all these things. And they are able to prey upon that and use that to their advantage if they are nefarious people. So yeah. I think it's important to, to understand that piece and where people get stuck. And this is why, you know, the, the psychology in, in of work spaces and work cultures is so important to understand in context and relation to the talent experience, because people can either use what they know about you to help or they mm. can use what they know to harm. And mm. so we continue to say, and again, not just in work, Mm -hmm. In all society, mm -hmm. bad behavior is rewarded if we deem the, the output of that bad behavior to be something more beneficial than right. the, the, the work of addressing that bad behavior. And right. all it does, it's like Pavlo's dog and conditioning. You're conditioning those bad actors to continue to do the bad acting because you're letting them know you can continue. We often, and the last piece for me is, we don't come together. I have this problem. You have this problem. You have this problem. They can ignore one or two people. 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. More 25. But we have this yes. thing like, oh, one person goes forth and does it. We don't. And it's human nature. It's in all societies. Right. But that's part of the problem. They cannot mm-hmm. ignore 25 people saying that they have an issue with this. 25 people that documented similar issues. Mm-hmm. 25 people that have receipts. Mm-hmm. They can dismiss. It's, it's a lot easier to lay off. There's a difference with a reduction in force where you got 25 people being laid off versus yeah. you're singling out this one person. Yeah. And I think the challenge. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. That's oh. and, that, and we, we give up and we trade our power as a yes. result of that. So I know we have to wind down because we're definitely way over. No, no, no. Make sure. No, no, no. Yeah. No, no, no. We, we, we flowing. Right. So, you know, something that when you were talking, it, re- it reminded me of something too, in terms of my own experience and something I've heard from so many black women too. Right. And I recently was interviewed by Stephanie Perry about black women leaving toxic jobs and just, astounded by the number of black women who have commented over like 600 comments about them having toxic jobs, right? Have a multiple, so not just one, multiple toxic job work, work experiences. And you, you're right, you know, in terms of many times we go through these, we don't talk about it, right? We keep it to ourselves, right? So many people don't know we're going through it. But I, what I have found and what I've experienced, which is so harmful and and very destructive is many times these toxic jobs, the bully is very vindictive, right? So when they, when people see that one person saying something against that person, they see what happens to that person. They're like, oh, not me, right? Like, uh uh-uh, I don't want that happening to me. And in fact, I had people at my job saying that to me. Like they said, "Uh uh-uh, Kamani, we saw what happened to you. Not going to do it, right? So it's a way to oppress and, and to, to keep people controlled by fear, right? So as we're winding down, what, I, what I'm just fascinated by and so curious by, if someone is experiencing a toxic work environment and they go to HR, what, what can they realistically expect? Yeah, that's a really good question. And thank you for that. Look, I'm speaking from my lens of HR, my experience, who knows I'm a good professional. Yes. So there is no blanket for all of that in terms of what you can expect, because Mm -hmm. every person, HR person is going to show up differently. And that's something you have to go into understanding, which is why I'm suggesting that you go into the conversation, asking them that very question. What should I expect from you or from the company? if I need to make a report, a complaint. Mm -hmm. And if they start telling me, well, tell me what's going on. No, 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 no. Right. Even like when I have recruiters reaching out to me, oh, send me your resume. Nope. We haven't even been on a date yet to have a conversation. Why am I just giving you over my resume? No. What if what you have to offer, I'm not interested in. So absolutely not. I'm not doing it. And if there are any recruiters on the call, please stop asking people to send you their resume. If you are sourcing them to look for roles, if you haven't even told them what it is, that they should be talking to you about, right? What, why would I walk into this without having any information? So right. have so the same thing, have a conversation to find out what, what should I expect from you? Is mm-hmm. there, what level of confidentiality, if any, can you confirm for me? Mm. What assurances can you provide for me? Like that's the thing that you want to do because yeah. there are no guarantees. There have been people who have come to me and told me things you know, you're mandated reporters. There are certain things by law I'm mandated to report to. If mm-hmm. someone tells you they were sexually assaulted or harassed at work, I can't mm-hmm. just sit there and be like, you know what? Thanks so much for telling me. I'm glad you got off your chest. No, I have a duty to right. act. I'm legally yeah. obligated to act. So yeah. find out what it is that they are going to do or what steps they're going to take. Well, how long should you expect a f- wait for a follow-up from them? Who all might need to be involved? Are there other people that you may need to talk to? Again, it goes back to educating yourself. And education isn't just, you know, things we talk about, the employment lawyers and knowing what your rights are. Even, by the way, understanding. And again, this is not just for the U.S. Anywhere. What are the laws specific Mm -hmm. to your employee records? Because I will tell you, in these United States of America, there is no federal law that says you can have access to your records. That is governed by state law. So if your state does not have something on file for that, guess what? They don't have to give you that. 
So again, educate yourself, understand it, but more importantly, just honor you. What do mm-hmm. you need? You we have yeah. as individuals to make a decision to say, am I going to continue in this relationship that is not honoring me, my mm-hmm. needs, and is no longer serving what I need at this moment? That is mm-hmm. detrimental to my health, detrimental to my wellness. Because what I will yeah. tell you is that when you are really stressed out, when you're not showing up as your best self, even if you're mm-hmm. applying for other jobs, even if you're interviewing, you're not showing up in your best light in those situations either because of what you are experiencing. So True. True. That's what I always talk about, right? So when we leave a toxic job, dealing with that, the 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 drama and trauma, I call it, right? So dealing with all that stuff, because it's like this ugh this, that you're in, right? And so when you have that ugh, you can't see clearly about what you're trying to go to, right? You can't see clearly in terms of what are the questions to be asking. So I go into another environment. So it's not a repeat or worse than what I just came from, right? So the healing part, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I talked about this yeah. coaching program I have about Black women healing from toxic jobs. How do we d- deal with, how do we heal so mm-hmm. we are in a better position to get to things that we mm-hmm. really want, right? Yeah, but yeah. we have to we have to not fast forward the healing part. And I think right. that's what a lot of- Because it hurts, doing. right? It's painful and it hurts, especially when it you've hurts. been disappointed by other yeah. people who look like you and you thought oh, this person was, I was really cool with at the job. Now something went down and now a relationship I thought I was going to have for a life. You've, you've also cut me off. Right. And you're a person right. of color. So yeah, again, we all have to figure out what that means for us and engage yeah. in those healing processes. Right. Yeah. You need, I'm a big water person. So I've, rec- I have literally recorded oceans, waves from places I've been. And when I'm stressed, that might be something I go to. Now there's a whole bunch of other things that I may do, but knowing what you need to do for yourself is going to be important. But please, 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 people stop sacrificing, giving over your power and negotiation, negotiating your value so willingly by just accepting the way that you're being treated. Now you may not be able to do anything about it in the organization, but you can certainly exit the organization. And please take off the rose colored glasses or the lens or the perspective that just that leaving them and going to another environment. I don't care how friendly everyone seems means that it's going to be an amazing experience and that nothing's ever going to happen. Again, organizations are made up of people who have biases and prejudice and different intersectional identities. So no organization telling you they have a zero tolerance or that they're a discrimination free zone. They are lying to you. Do not yeah. accept that. So yeah. yes, it's exciting in the beginning, like any new thing that we experienced. Like, oh, this yeah. is great. But please stop walking into these environments thinking everything is going to be rosy and amazing now because mm-hmm. that will impact your ability to accept yeah. if something happens to you. Yes. So going in as a realist, right? Not like Always. super not but not idealist, realist. realist. Yes. And also understand that when you've gone through a toxic job or you've had multiple toxic jobs, that healing's ongoing, right? So for me, I'm still healing. Same. You know what I'm saying? Many people I know are still healing from toxic jobs. So understand that the healing is possible, but you need to take time to recognize you've been harmed and get that support. So that kind of ties into how we're winding down. So Dr. Claire, what would you share with the audience about when you've been in a toxic job, how do you heal? How do you heal? Yeah, I mean... I love this conversation and I'm really so happy that we were able to do it. I'm really blessed to be able to partner with my twin sister to do this. I, I've i learned so much from her. I think she is one of the smartest people I actually know on the planet. Um, even though I'm darker than her right now because my tan is still tanning, I am so, <laughs> sure. I am so grateful. Um, but I, I think that we, we have touched on some of this a bit and I want to say to the audience and and those, I'm really grateful that you've continued to be with us on this journey for the questions, the comments. I see you. I feel you. We know. The first thing is to acknowledge that what you are experiencing is real, that it is harmful, that is toxic, that is abusive, and you are not deserving of anything less than Mm -hmm. of anything that honors the dignity, the value, and the gift that you are to the world. Mm -hmm. You and your experiences matter. You and your experiences are real. 
Yes. Please, please, please do not minimize the experience. Do not ignore the harm. Uh, coming from a culture, particularly with black culture, where it's like, you know, we got to work 10 times as hard to get half. Those are toxic things that we pass down from generation to generation. And we tell ourselves, yes, there's systemic racism and oppression, but we cannot mm -hmm. continue to oppress ourselves with that mindset and tell ourselves that we should just bend and bear it. No, no. No, and speak, particularly when you talk the culture, I'm from the West Indies, like we have a whole other layer of the, this toxic culture with, with a suit, like you just deal with it. No, dealing with it means that we have three times the maternal mortality rate in America, means that in children, are, black children are dying. It means that black children are being uh, diagnosed younger and younger with severe mental health needs. It means that Black women are dying younger and younger. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. So yeah. please, the first step is acknowledging. The second step I will say is because we, it's a privilege to just say, quit your job. You, you, need, you might need a game plan. Sometimes yeah. it might be to the point where you have no game plan, but it's either your life or your job and you got to go. Because yeah. you stay there and you die. And somebody's yep. planning your funeral because yep. we have probably all known people who have died. Yep. Literally, I have people who have died while at work. Mm. And guess what? The next day or the same day, their desk is cleared out. Wow. So acknowledge and don't gaslight yourself. Yeah. You need to put boundaries in place for yourself and make a plan. Uh, if, if you stay and when you go and whatever that means for you, mm -hmm. you, you engage your resources if you can, but you also need to take time to heal. One of the things I see a lot, and again, I recognize the privileged piece is people leave a job on, on Friday and start a new job on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. I know that some yeah. financial pieces and all that stuff, right? If you, if you have the privilege of, of earning vacation time, maybe you can plan it. So maybe you'll get paid out the extra two weeks. You have to take time to recoup. Yes. And that's not because you are less than. It's because that's literally the way our bodies and our minds are wired. We need a break. Yeah. And get in community, whatever that means for you. If it's a spiritual group, if you have a spiritual identification, if it's a friend group, if you have it, it's family. But you need to process this stuff. And processing stuff is not with your family and friends. You're right. <laughs> you need to go to therapy. <laughs> you need to find a therapist that's going to honor you because not every therapist is is about this racial and social justice anti-oppressive life either right not every yeah. therapist is going to connect with you just like you don't everybody's not your cup of tea you, every therapist is not either get into therapy not only because you need to process the trauma mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there may be some other things going on in your life that you need to process yeah. get into therapy address your physical health I cannot yeah. tell you how many people I know, and even myself included, have been guilty of not making the doctor's appointments, not taking the time off, all this stuff because of the stress of working. And guess what? You go to the doctor finally and it's like, oh, gee, this is really bad. So I want you to acknowledge what you're going through. I want you to put boundaries in place and start your game plan for exiting a toxic space because you deserve better. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. want you to engage your community and your, your family and your, your friend circles. Do the things. Go to walk. Exercise. Drink water. Exercise is great. But also, yes. I need you to get into therapy. Yes. Please, please, please. Because yes. it is toxic and you need to be able to heal. And yeah. you cannot heal. And something you say a lot, Dr. K, you can't heal where you've been harmed. You're not exactly. going to heal the environment that's hurting you. Yes. I, I've, I've gone through it. And it's not because yeah. I'm, that means everybody, but there's too many stories. You deserve better than what you're getting. Mm -hmm. You deserve to be loved and whole, valued, honored, and respected. Not for any other reason that other than you're human. Yeah. You're a person. Your personhood should say that. And because you carry different intersectional identities, whether it's because you're a black woman, whether it's because you're a black person who in the LGBTQ plus community, whether because you're a black person who is married or unmarried or child or, or have children or don't have children, whatever those things are, 
stripping all that away. You deserve it because it is a right, not a privilege yes. to be treated with respect and yeah. to be valued. You do not have to stay where people are not serving love, honor, and respect. Love yourself enough to know you are worth it. May it take a little bit more stress? Absolutely. May it be a little bit more uh, struggle in trying to figure out how do I pivot? Yes. If that means you might need to get into coaching, Charmaine is a certified coach as well, by the way. Uh, IPEC certified coach. If you need a coach, hit, there you go. Um, whatever those things are to help you navigate through those things, do it. But stop making excuses and taking the time. Uh, you mentioned Dr. Nadia Lopez. I had the privilege to meet with her in December. Oh, my God. Beautiful human being, beautiful woman inside and out. And uh, so gracious and so real. And her passion for people is so real. I am so grateful for that connection. So I'm using that to say it's the last thing. Get in connection with other people who will value and validate you. Yes, beautifully stated, beautifully stated. And, you know, just for us to remember to, you know, healing is an ongoing process and be mindful when you're at a job and you're not being respected, you're not being affirmed, you're trying to prove your worth, all these different things. But most importantly, when you're being harmed, you need to pause and pay attention to that. Okay. I know as black people, we've been taught, you keep fighting, nobody gets you out of there. You no, no, no. It's not worth your life. It's not. It's not worth it. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that I'll put in the description section about therapy and how to find a black therapist. Okay. So there's resources available for you to find a black therapist. And just like when you are in a relationship, you need to interview that therapist to make sure it's a good fit. Okay. Because sometimes you just don't click with certain people and that's fine. Don't give up on therapy. Just keep looking for the right therapist, okay? So just be mindful of that, okay? So as we're winding down, ladies, I want to read the last comments. I want to share, I want you to share with the audience about how they can contact you guys and the services that you have available. And then I'll share also about my coaching program and we'll wind down, okay? So in terms of, um, you know, people just saying thank you, thank you. Um, also talking about, you know, their experience with HR just in general. Um, I worked in a place where the, where the biggest bully was the head of HR. Um, hello, I just found your channel. I've been enjoying your perspective. Um, she's a social worker, um, and she understands a lot what we're talking about. Bullying happens way too often, and the individuals who are inflicting the behavior are aware that they can get away with it, either directly or indirectly. Also, the culture of workplace bullying tends to start from the top. I've been harmed by HR as a Black woman. Um, who should you go to if you report to HR, Black female, new, and you are already experiencing poor, unprofessional work exchanges and distrusting behavior? Leadership is not an option. They're toxic. What would you say about that, Shara? Yeah, so if the person doesn't feel comfortable going to their HR and they don't feel comfortable going within, if this person was within the U.S., Many states and cities also have services, right? So we talked about the EOC, but for example, New York City has a New York City Human Rights Commission, right? You can contact these local state you know, or city agencies and just have a conversation with someone to understand what are my rights? This is what's happening, right? You can file a formal complaint through them and have them investigate the organization if that's what needs to happen. But if you just got somewhere and these types of things are happening, Please don't. And I've had this conversation personally with so many black women that I know, love, deeply and respect. So we need to stop thinking we can fix this. No. I can't fix you. I don't want to fix you. And I'm not skilled to fix you. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to leave you. Yes, I'm, so I'm, gonna, so. I'm going to leave you. And, I, and yes. we, need to be, we need to stop viewing it as a failure on our part. Yes. To not be able to make systematic change or behavioral change in places and people that are harming us. That is an yes. individual decision until that person decides that they want to engage and show up differently. There's nothing we can do about that. We have to stop telling ourselves, well, if I do this, if I do that, right? If yes. I go to the gym and work out five hours today, I may be exhausted, right? But that five hours in one day is not going to have significant long-term 
last and impacts on me. It has to be something like over time. So over yeah. time, if you're observing something and it's consistent, you have to decide, is this consistency what I want or is it not? You know, because yeah. we are so over time, you know, but this is a good <laughs> conversation. Look, our website and Dr. K is going to drop it. It's chapter2.com. Encourage everyone to go there. A lot of the things that we've been talking about, if you sign up for our insights, right? We call in gems and gemisodes. Gems, just so everyone knows, is when we do standalone essays and a gemisode is a series, right? Think about an episode. So I'll have more than one part to it. But there's a complimentary guide that we created by our amazing designer, Janelle, who I think is on this call. And it's really moving from angst to anchored. How do you move from angst to anchored, right? Because we start in a place of angst to anchored. I mean, angst, and then we want to move towards being more anchored, whether that's within ourselves, whether it's that sense within systems, and really anchored is about close, getting closer to belonging. So if you sign up, you'll get that complimentary guide. And it's not just for workplaces. These are steps that you can implement for yourself as a human, as an individual in your own life for the areas that you need to move through, for the areas of forgiveness that you may need for yourself or other people, because these steps are applicable professional and in personal settings. So I would encourage everyone to do that. And this has been an amazing, amazing conversation. We probably need a part two because of how this, how this yeah. works some things, but really appreciate yeah. everyone hanging in there because these are the things that we need to talk about and know about Absolutely. people being empowered Absolutely. and empowerment comes through education and awareness. Yes. I see another comment that just came in. What if you work for government who are not adhering to the policies they enforce? Well, if we're talking about the U.S., I will tell you that there's a reason why I personally have never wanted to work for the government, right? These things are harder. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's harder, right? The mm -hmm. federal laws and federal agencies are not subjected to all of the other things that other non-federal or government agencies would be. So that goes back to understanding your rights and knowing what those laws are specific to the type of place that you're in. As I mentioned, that over 70 percent of people are in at-will employees in in the US that doesn't apply to you know certain certain government entities it doesn't apply to you know people who have collective who are unions collective bargaining agreements more often than not so just the same i would say the same thing understand what your rights are know what is and isn't okay legally because what isn't or isn't okay it's still going to happen in the workplace right so just understand legally what you're entitled to so as the last thing to close this out, people have said to me, I'm in a toxic work environment mm -hmm. or I'm in a hostile work environment. Hostile work environment has a legal definition attached to it. So unless you can show or unless it's correlated, it mm -hmm. does not rise to that level. So people are using these terms sometimes and thinking, well, now the next step is going to be or the outcome should be. And they may not recognize that there's no legal basis or protection based on what they're experiencing. Just because mm. you labeled it hostile work environment doesn't mean that it meets the legal definition of hostile work environment. So, again, miss, you know, expectations based on misunderstanding, you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. So yes. then chapter two dot com, T O O dot com, download the angst to anchor guide. But more importantly, you know, regardless of the space that you're in, educate yourself on your rights, understand what's available to you. It's not in the, if it's not within the organization, is there yeah. a city or state or federal agency or if you're in a different country, like a tribunal that has oversight mm -hmm. for laws or issues governing employee experiences or discrimination that you can have a conversation with? That's the route I would recommend someone to go. Awesome. Awesome. And if you're in LA, I'm also going to put in the description section. LA has a um, commission on civil rights also. So I'll put that in the description section. So look in your area. Okay. So as we're winding down, yes, the, the chat has been popping. We've had a lot of engagement here. I um, mean, clearly we need a part two, right? Because there's a lot more for us to discuss, right? And I hope that you heard the many takeaways from this conversation one is that no job is worth your life, right? And you don't owe your job your life, right? So in terms of boundaries, right? You have a life outside of your job. Your job does not define who you are, okay? So recognize that. Engage in all the different things that we talked about. Remember, soak it in, right? This is a very long video, right? There's a lot we talked about. 
So if you need to watch the inceptions, go back and watch the inceptions, okay? Please share this video with other Black women who might need to see this video, who might need the information shared in this video, okay? So again, watch the video as many times you want or as you need. Share with other Black women. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, Lifting Us Through Time Consulting, Wellness Services. Um, I'll have resources available in the description section. One of the resources that I have is the Black Women Healing from Toxic Jobs Group Coaching Program. Again, it's for Black women who are ready to leave your job, okay? And for you to deal with that trauma and drama and all that mess so that you can have a clarity, a sense of purpose, sense of understanding of where you're going. But a lot of times we're so wrapped up in so much trauma that we don't have that clarity, right? It's hard for us to exit plan. It's hard for us to do all these other things because we're dealing with all that mess, okay? So if you want information about that, then I have that in the description section. If you want a roadmap to help you because you're like so disconnected, you're in a toxic job, you're so disconnected from yourself, I have the Welcome to Your Queendom Digital Fillable Workbook, which also helps you, which should help me. That's how I developed it when I was in a toxic job, okay? So please tune in as we have follow-up discussions. I want to thank you all for tuning in and all of the lively conversation and the comments. I want to say a special thank you to my guests for being here today and sharing your wisdom, your brilliance. And we will sign off for now and we will see you soon. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Stay on for me. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a good evening.